Well, hello everybody. Hello from my office here at uh, West Virginia University. We're going to look at the quarterly results for Salesforce.com for the most recent quarter. We'll have a bit of an introduction. We'll talk about the income statement and retained earnings. Then we'll move on to the exciting topic of deferred revenue. And we'll end up talking about things that we'll talk about next time around. So let's have a look right over here. Normally, I will go on to www.sec.gov, click on the top right, enter the company's ticker symbol, and then go and look at the 10 Ks and the 10 Qs. In this case, I also included, because everything was so new, the um, uh, news flash or the uh, news uh, press release from Salesforce on Tuesday afternoon. So, Tuesday afternoon after the close, Everyone is ecstatic. Everything that should go up was up. Everything that should go down went down. And indeed, the stock price took an amazing jump upwards. So, was it so great? Or should we have a closer look? I think we should have a closer look. A bit of history. We go back to fiscal 2008, which ended uh, January 31st of 2008. And I look at 13 years with this being the latest guidance for the uh, current fiscal year. And I see that we have compounded at 29.12% per year. This graph is truly impressive, but I think we need to answer or ask a few questions. This was the stock price this week. Monday, everything seemed okay. Then Salesforce, it was announced, added to the Dow up on Tuesday. And this was after the earnings release. And it looks like it is up, up and away. If I go further back in time, the stock here was about $10 per share. We're up to $270. So from the 1st of uh, January 2007 to now, you could have multiplied your money by 27 fold. Let's start looking at the numbers. For the six months ended, July 31st, 2020, total revenues, 10.16 billion. They just made 10 billion. Income from operations, 38 million. And I'm going to net off the 26. Income from operations, 12 billion. This is extremely low. The real money was made with the gains on strategic investments. And this number here, that just crept in to the, uh, just above the bottom line. So, did they know that this number was so paltry? Yes, they did. If we go to the common size income statement, total revenues, 100%. Income from operations, 0%. They couldn't even get income from operations to round up to 1%. Now we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive here. At the beginning of fiscal 2008, accumulated deficit of 35 million. Now we have retained earnings of 4,585 million. The change from here to there over these 13 years increase of 4.621 billion in retained earnings. Let's see where this came from. I took a deep dive. I looked at the gains on the strategic investments. I looked at the gains on the sale. You can see your buildings. And I looked at the investment income. All since uh, February 1st, 2007. Then I added these numbers together. And I saw 2,374 million, nothing to do with operations. And if I look at this percentage here, uh, that increase in retained earnings, 51.4%. So, 51.4% of the increase in retained earnings had nothing to do with the operations. It was all investment income, that and that. Indeed, if you had, in 2007, invested $1 billion in this company, you could have had all this investment income here. 
And if round about 2018, you invested another 2 billion, you could have had all these gains over here. So for $3 billion, you could have had that as your return over the 13 year period. But let's go ahead and have a look here. At the bottom of the income statement, we have some kind of benefit related to income taxes. And on the balance sheet, we have this number, which is higher, but it says, and other assets. During the latest quarter, the company recorded two, a, a $2 billion benefit from income taxes due to a one-time discrete tax item. In other words, this company is now going to be entitled to a slightly lower tax rate uh, in the years going forward. And the benefit now of that lower tax rate going forward is $2 billion. And this is all right there in that retained income number. Let me do an analogy here. Remember this $2 billion? It's almost like the fuel points program at your local uh, retailer. What happens is at the end of August, you have some fuel points and it will allow you a discount in September when you buy your fuel. And so what this company is saying, hmm, we're going to get a discount on our taxes in the future if we make profit. And that discount's worth about $2 billion. You know, I don't think that that has anything to do with operations. So other companies have these, uh, it's called a deferred tax asset. This is SNAP. Deferred tax asset, it's big. They don't put it on the balance sheet. They use something like a valuation allowance and they write it down to near zero. And I've seen other companies as well when the profits, Uber, when the profits are uh, not so clear in the years ahead, they write this down to zero. So let's redo this now. All that investment income and the gains, 2.3 billion, that deferred tax asset that has nothing to do with operations is here. Well, nothing to do with operations yet. Total, 4.3 billion. I now divide this by the change in retained earnings and 94.7% of this retained earnings is due to that and that. Income from software, which is the other residual, 246 million. And if I add all these sales together, it is 96 billion over the 13 years. This divided by that is less than a quarter percent. However, I need to be a little bit fair here I'm taking the income from software up until here, and I'm taking all the revenues up until there. There's a chance that they make uh, income from operations in this little segment over here, which will increase this, but increase it to what? 1%? Deferred revenue. Let's do a little lesson here. On the 28th of August, a passenger buys a return ticket on Southwest Airlines the flights are on those days. So, on the day that the ticket is purchased, debit cash, debit the credit card fees, credit, unearned revenue. This is what unearned revenue is. And just as the flight lands, what South and West Airlines will do is they will do a debit to unearned revenue and a credit to passenger revenue at the end of the second flight, the same journal entry. And now what happens is we now have $392 in revenue and it's recognized on, on the days that the flight lands. We can make it a little more complicated and say that on the day that the ticket is purchased, that credit card fee is debited to prepaid expenses. So when the flight lands, essentially what they do is they credit passenger revenue with $4, they credit prepaid expenses, and now we have the credit card fees being a debit on that day and the revenue being a credit. So they pretty much defer this until the flights are, have been taken. You can have a closer look at this and study it, but this is what unearned revenue is all about. You hold it until the service is delivered and then you release it into revenue. Now, prepaid expenses, 
I was looking at those uh, credit card fees, and this is the Accounting Standards Codification number 340. I think it would be okay to put those um, credit card fees in prepaid expenses. Other companies have deferred revenue. Adobe, plenty of deferred revenue or unearned revenue. Zoom, deferred revenue, deferred revenue. So it's pretty normal accounting. Now, what I'm concerned about is that the controller on one day says, you know what, I have all this unearned revenue that's really a nice big credit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to debit unearned revenue and I'm just going to credit revenues. And I'm going to do this on the basis that, you know, perhaps 1% of our customers stop using the software uh, for some other reason. And for those 1%, I've delivered everything that I need to deliver, then actually just not going to use it anymore. If that is true, this entry might be okay. However, you might make up a reason and fraudulently simply debit unearned revenue, credit revenue, and hey presto, you have $10 million that you just manufactured by journal entry. So, let's do a little simulation here. I made up an example, you can pause the video, read it through slowly, or I'll just highlight the important sentences here. It's a new company. They charge customers $3.60 to use the software for one year. For each day in year one, they sell exactly one app at one minute past midnight for $3.60. So, there are 360 days in the year, four quarters, 90 days each. Here's a little graph. On day one, they sell an app for $3.60. On every single day, they sell exactly one app for $3.60. For this person here, they have earned the entire $3.60. But for this person, they've only earned one day of revenue. Well, I did my simulation like this. And then I calculated deferred revenues as a percentage of revenues, and I was unhappy with the result, mainly because this is not how Salesforce operates. Salesforce has a load. More customers sign on in the fourth quarter than sign on in any other quarter. So I changed my simulation and I dug numbers out of here and I put them in here so they have the fourth quarter loaded. I then did the simulation and you know, didn't look like Salesforce either. I then said, I need some gross. So now what I'm doing is I'm loading the fourth quarter and I'm adding 25% gross here. So I'm adding extra customers and I'm adding even more customers in the fourth quarter. This is not every day. Um, and so, now what I have is something that's more like Salesforce. And indeed, this was for the third year, even though I, it looks like the second year of the graph. I just can't get the graph to look that busy. And then what I did for each quarter, I did a income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows. I knew I have uh, cash on hand, deferred revenue, I have retained income. Everything balances. This is beautiful. Feel free to pause the video and audit my numbers. And right at the end of year three, I then took deferred revenue as a percentage of revenue uh, of uh, revenue over here, and I got 73%. Aha! Now I have what I think should be Salesforce's percentage. I then go and I take Salesforce's unearned revenue, I divide it by the subscription revenue, and I get 66.5%. My simulation showed 73%. The gap, indeed, is 6.5%. And if I multiply the gap um, by the revenue number over here, I see that what I might have is a billion dollars pulled forward from a future quarters into this quarter. Um, and indeed, 
I'm looking at this number and I'm thinking that's a billion dollars at most. Maybe my simulation is wrong. Maybe um, 0.665 is correct. So at worst, a billion dollars has been put forward. At worst for me, my simulation is wrong and nothing has been pulled forward. In summary, I actually think that if they have done something like this, it's been small. It's not big and it's not blatant. So I think what we do is we give them a pass on this and uh, next video I'll have a look at the uh, ratios again in more detail. Uh, feel free to send me some suggestions. Now, for my next video, we are going to look at under current assets, cost capitalized to obtain revenue contracts. I think this is salesperson's commission. And we also have it here in fixed assets. Goodwill, $26 billion, of which $10 billion is um, due to Tableau. And here we have that the third tax asset, it's $2 billion, and then they say plus other assets. So we're going to have a closer look at that. We're also going to have a closer look at marketing and sales divided by total revenues. If I do this division, marketing and sales, divided by total revenues, I get a percentage of 44%. It's sky high. However, in Salesforce's case, it's been even higher. So these are the numbers we'll look at next time. I hope you can hang on for the next installment, maybe in a month or two from now. Let's see what happened recently on Wednesday. You can read the headlines yourself. And my personal thought here is they know that the earnings from operations are, as you saw, that the percentage there is zero. Or if we round it um, to the nearest 1%, it is indeed zero. And what they are doing is they need to do this in order to get those income from operations up. And here is the irony. Salesforce is laying off people. These rosy predictions for the future assume increased sales, but they can't increase the sales if their customers are also laying off people because the licenses are, is on a per, per person basis. So they will be losing revenue if their customers do exactly, ironically, what they did. So please go to my website, have a look at the tabs, I think you'll enjoy what's there. And I'm thinking that for future installments, we're going to take a closer look at Twitter and also a closer look at Uber. And so from me to you, it's bye-bye.